Okay, guys. So the Little Rock Nine continued. So you have Elizabeth Eckford going to school on the first day that she thought she was going to go to this this, this white school. They're going to try to integrate it. And the famous picture of Hazel Brown calling Elizabeth every name in the book. Here's Hazel right there. Here's Elizabeth. What's amazing about this story is that I think 30 years later on Oprah Winfrey, they got together and talked about it. Hazel called up Elizabeth to apologize. Thank goodness Elizabeth was compassionate and forgiving enough to say, okay, I'll meet you. And right in front of the Little Rock High, High School, she was able to apologize. So in my opinion, it's also a redemption story where a racist little girl like Hazel here on the left could have a change of heart and realize that carrying around all this hate and ugliness is not getting her anywhere. So here's a great video about it. It was in September that nine black students, six girls and three boys, became forever known as the Little Rock Nine. On September 2nd of that year, days before Central High was to be integrated, Governor Orville Faubus of Arkansas ordered National Guardsmen to surround the school. Their orders? To only let the white students in. I acted to protect the persons and property of the people of Little Rock. Faubus was defying the Supreme Court decision which required desegregation of schools. Little a judge Linda Brown. Later ruled that Faubus used the troops to prevent integration, not to preserve law and order, as he had claimed. To avoid any further violence and to enforce the law, President Eisenhower sent in troops of his own. Do you get it, guys? This is classic. You got the, the governor of Arkansas saying, we don't want to have a integrated school. And then you got the federal government. You got the federal government, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the guy who uh, was responsible for D-Day, who led D-Day against Hitler, saying, nope, Supreme Court says segregation is not going to happen anymore. I'm going to send in the federal troops. So you had the state troopers having to bow down to the federal troops these nine kids were able to go to school. Jane issued an executive order directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay. So they went to school, and uh, out of the nine, I believe eight graduated. One was kicked out because she was tired of being called every name in the book, and she ended up uh, throwing some food or putting her her, her uh, lunch tray, throwing her lunch tray down at somebody, so she got expelled. I doubt if she was a white girl, she would have been expelled. So that's the famous Little Rock Nine. Almost every one of the Little Rock Nine became successful people for the rest of their lives. It's really great to do some research on uh, the Little Rock Nine. Okay, Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed. For the Times 3 put down, John F. Kennedy wanted it, so President Johnson continued it after Kennedy was assassinated. So 1963, Kennedy shot in the back of the head while he's driving his uh, convertible through Dallas, Texas. The Dallas congressman... LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, takes over as president and says, America, JFK wanted this passed. I think we should pass it in his honor. Because JFK saw how African Americans were being treated with being hosed, uh, huge hoses, throwing them up against walls, dogs biting them as they protested. And JFK said, we can't have this. I, I can't believe this is happening. Let's face it, if you're a wealthy guy who's grown up outside Boston, you don't know too much about racism. Thank goodness 
We had television coming into people's homes in the 1960s, or none of this might have happened. Just like with television showing the Vietnam War, we had television showing the way these teenagers, for Birmingham, so many of them were teenagers protesting, skipping school to protest, and these dogs are biting them, they're being hosed up against the wall. JFK saw this and said, we've, we've got to do something about that. So that's one of the big reasons the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. So for the Times 3 put, it's illegal to discriminate because of race, religion. Okay? You could put gender, but I don't really think so. Unfortunately, women were still getting discriminated against. So Civil Rights Act, for the most part, because of someone's race and because of someone's religion, you cannot discriminate against them. Equal Protection Clause, number eight, Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Linda Brown versus Topeka, Kansas, right here. Brown versus Board of Ed, remember that one? That's all because of the 14th Amendment. Remember, the 14th Amendment goes with the Reconstruction Acts. You had 13th Amendment, abolish slavery. 14th Amendment said, okay, you're not a slave, you're a citizen. And 15th Amendment said, now you can vote. But the 14th Amendment has something called, a very famous clause called the Equal Protection Clause. That's why even the American with Disabilities Act of 1991, they used the 14th Amendment. What? I can't have the job because I'm in a wheelchair? That's against my 14th Amendment rights, Amendment rights, equal protection of the law. I'm going to sue you. What? I can't go out for basketball because you don't have a girls' basketball team? I'm going to sue you. I don't have equal protection of the law. And that gets us to... Affirmative action, actually, no, we'll get to something else later. Okay, so put that for equal protection clause. Linda Brown, Board of Education. Even Roe versus Wade, which is very controversial, used the equal protection law. Roe versus Wade legalized abortion in America because uh, Jane Roe, her name, real name was not Jane Roe, but it's like John Doe. She said, I live in Texas and I can't get an abortion. It's not fair if I lived in California or New York or some of these more liberal states, I could get an abortion. And I went to the Supreme Court and I think it was five to four. They said, yeah, that's against her equal protection uh, rights. She should be able to get one. It's not fair because she's not or she's not wealthy enough to take a, an airplane to one of these more liberal states to get an abortion. So 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, very important. So also put uh, Roe versus Wade for abortion, use 14th Amendment. And American with Disabilities Act, make sure you know that one for the test. American with Disabilities Act, you can't be discriminated against because you have a disability. Okay, number nine, affirmative action, very important. The best way I could describe affirmative action is my aunt, she's not alive anymore, but she um, told me a story how she was a guidance counselor and she would have this happen numerous times. Mrs. Neporty, I need to talk to you. What's up, Maria? I feel so sad. I thought I was going to get into that college. I can't believe I didn't get in. That's my first choice. I really want to get into that college. Um, well, Maria, did you, did you, in the college application, did you put the little box there that says you're Hispanic? No, what does that have to do with anything? I want to get in just because of my grades and everything. I don't want any special treatment. Maria, have you ever heard of affirmative action? I, I don't, I think I was absent that day in history class. Affirmative action, affirmative means positive. So it's like positive action. Basically, what affirmative action is, Maria, is because of all the discrimination for African Americans and Hispanic people and other people that are not white who have come to this country over years and years of racism and discrimination, statistically, there's more white kids in the colleges than African Americans and Hispanic kids or Native American kids, etc. So just to have a little affirmative, a little positive action, 
the colleges and some jobs like fire, fire jobs and police officer jobs, they want to have it where there's more, not, it's, it's not mostly all white people. They're going to give some positive or affirmative action to non-white people. They're going to give them a little extra special preferences. Little like, for example, uh, if you have 1,200 on the SAT, if you're white, that's about equal to 1,100 on SAT if you're not white, because we're going to bump it up a little bit, some positive uh, action because of all the discrimination. So, Maria, put down in the box that you're Hispanic. It's going to help you get into the college, because they also think it's good for the white kids to hang out with more Hispanic and African American and Native American kids. It's not just for... These kids, they also think it's good for their white kids to get to know other people instead of just hanging out with white kids their whole life. They want to have more of a mixture of people in the, in the colleges. All right, I'll do it. Three, three, three weeks later, I got in. I got in. So that's affirmative action. Uh, a great example of affirmative action is President Obama. President Obama has said, look, Affirmative action helped me. Affirmative action, I got into Harvard. He, he got, he was a great student at Harvard, but he wasn't such a serious student in, uh, in high school. Um, so he said, I might not have gotten into Harvard if it wasn't for affirmative action. Okay. Now, there's some people call that reverse discrimination, though. And what's happening, some colleges are being sued by Asian students and white students saying, excuse me, this is against my 14th Amendment rights. I'm not having equal protection of the law. You took this kid in. I have nothing against them. But you took this kid in with SATs of this. And my daughter has SATs of this. And you're discriminating against my kid because they're white? That's against my 14th Amendment equal protection law. So a lot of the colleges, they don't want to touch it because they're getting sued. So they're getting affirmative actions, not as big as it used to be, but it's definitely still around in some places. Okay. That's what affirmative action is. It's very important to know that. Okay. Women's liberation. Let me make sure this is still working. Very, very good. Women's liberation. Now, Women's liberation for the Times 3 put down to kind of piggyback the civil rights movement, okay? Think of it like this. The 1950s is when the civil rights for African Americans and like non-whites starts. So on top of that, because you had women helping uh, African Americans and protests and stuff like that, it kind of piggybacked that. 1950s, you think of African Americans going for rights. 1960s, women going for more rights. And... Got to say, one of the big reasons, the 50s, the economy was really good. So, ain't no woman of mine's going to work. I want you, what are the, what are the men going to say at my job if they know my wife is working? They're going to say, who, who has, uh, where's the pants in the family? No, honey, I just bought you a new sewing machine and a new oven and a new refrigerator for your birthday. You're very happy in the kitchen, aren't you? So in the 1950s, because the economy was pretty good, women basically were at home as housewives, like my mom. I remember getting in an argument with her. I was such an idiot. I said, you never worked a day in your life, mom. What a jerk I was. She worked probably five times harder than my dad, who was off traveling around on business. She had to take care of eight kids every day. That's a job. That's a ridiculously hard job. Okay. She never really worked until much later on when we were all in college and stuff. Worked. Okay. So that was the 1950s. So in the 1960s, the economy wasn't quite as good. So women kind of had to start working. And once you get that paycheck, hey, honey, can you get me a beer? Hey, honey, can you uh, get my clothes ready? I got a big uh, uh, presentation tomorrow. Can you iron all my stuff? Uh, no, dear, I'm tired from work. What? I've been working all day too. So the fact that women start working because households needed the money more in the 60s and then 70s for sure. 70s, the economy was not good at all, especially 70s. 
This is called the women's liberation movement, okay? So put for the times three, this is more of the 60s and 70s, and the economy not being as good was one of the reasons, because once you get that paycheck, that gives you power. In the 40s and 50s, you probably didn't get divorced because you know, what are you going to do? But then later on, hey, I'm not happy with this guy. I've got money in the bank. Buddy, it's not working out. I'm leaving, okay? All right, so Betty Friedan wrote something called The Feminine Mystique. The Feminine Mystique The Feminine Mystique was uh, a groundbreaking book. It's, it started with what's called the second wave of feminism. The first wave was way back in 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention, and all about trying to get the right to vote. That's called the first wave, say from the 1840s, excuse me, 1840s to about 1920s, wanting the right to vote, finally women about 1919, 19th Amendment, right to vote, okay? And then we had the world wars, women were working and stuff, but for the most part, 1950s, back in, back in the kitchen, cooking, having that meal ready when hubby gets home, all right? So when this book came out, basically what this book did, she, Betty Friedan interviewed so many happy housewives. Uh, excuse me, my name is Betty Friedan. Can I just ask you a few questions? Sure. So is this your uh, wonderful house? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, is that your swimming pool in back? Yes. Uh, where's your husband now? Oh, he's working. He'll be home at 5 o'clock. I'll have the dinner ready for him. I see these pictures of these wonderful children you have. Uh, yes, they're, they're in after school now. I think the bus will bring them home. Can I just ask you, um, must be wonderful. You've got everything you've ever... Well... Honestly, I feel empty. Excuse me? I feel like there's something missing. I'm a... I'm a mother. I'm a wife. But what am I for myself? From when I was little, my dad and mom said, find a good man. Maybe go to college a year just to find somebody. And once you find that man, you can stop going to college. Because basically college, let's just face it, is to go find a good man that's going to have a good job because he's a college student. And that's what I did. And um, he keeps on getting me appliances for my birthday and for Christmas. And he keeps on getting me all these nice jewelry. But there's something missing because I feel like I haven't really... I haven't really um, fulfilled myself. I haven't really under figured out what I want to do, what makes me happy in life. And women read this book and they're like, oh my God, I feel the same way. The feminine mystique, it was like the unspoken sadness that so many women were carrying around with them. The unspoken unfulfillment. And that was 1963. That was, remember we mentioned Emmett Till? The death of Emmett Till was like a spark that sparked the civil rights movement. This book was kind of like the spark for women's liberation or women's rights movement. A lot of women started saying, I want to be happy. What do you mean you're not happy? I just bought you a new toaster. I'm sorry, but we need to talk. Uh, no, I don't. No, 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 no. Men don't talk. Give me some more ice cream. That's all I want from you. Now we really need to talk. Okay, do you get the idea? It's just so important. There's, to, to, to be your authentic self and to feel fulfilled as a person is a lifetime of uh, trying. Everybody's trying to do that. And in the 1960s and 70s, a lot of women... A good example is my older sister and my mom. My mom was the old-fashioned, oh, Sue. And my sister Sue was on the front lines protesting against the Vietnam War, doing all this stuff. And I think my mom felt like she should kind of stay more quiet. 
there's like a whole different generation. My sister's generation started in the 1960s protesting and standing up. I remember her, my sister arguing with my dad more than I ever argued with him. I was, she really stood up. She had to find her voice. But, yeah, I'll stop there. I don't want to share too much personal stuff about my sister with that. But, okay, here we go. Another one. So put for the times four, what I just talked about. Pause it if you have to. Let me, how we, I'm going to see how I'm doing with time here. Okay, it's still going. Another one was Gloria Steinem. Ms. Magazine started in 1971. Gloria Steinem is one of the most famous women's rights activists, women's liber. Oh, you're one of those libers? Remember the 60s, women started having very short skirts, Women stopped wearing bras. Believe it or not, the way people dress has a lot to do with how much freedom they have. Just like in the 1920s, we said the flappers started doing the same thing. It's like the, the 1920s came back again in the 60s and 70s with fashion. And Gloria Steinem started a magazine called Ms., which was controversial right there. Right? Uh, your name, please? Mrs. Smith. Oh, you're married. Sorry, we don't want you for the job. Why not? You know, you're married, you're a housewife, you got to cook for your kids and your husband. Sorry, we want a single woman. Next. Hey, Bill, just give me misses. Anybody that's a missus, I don't want to see them. Just give me a miss. I want somebody who's not married. A miss. M-I-S-S, -S, Bill. How many times do I have to tell you? I don't want any misses in this job. I want a miss. So Gloria Steinem said, you know what? Women need to have a new one too. Mister, can you tell if Mister is married or not, guys? Mister, no. So in the 1970s, Ms. Magazine, Ms. M.S. period. It was very controversial. It still is. Some teachers go by Mrs. Others go by Ms. I mean, I was brought up in a conservative, old-fashioned household. I'll tell you, when I first started teaching 30 years ago, if there were some teachers that were Ms., there was part of me, probably my dad's voice talking in me, why don't they use Mrs.? But in a way, I think Mrs. is a good idea because why shouldn't women be able to be M.S. and then you can't tell if they're married or not? Ms., Ms. So that's what that was all about. Ms. Magazine was huge. And it really talked about controversial subjects. It was a woman's magazine. It's still around. Now I think it's like uh, monthly and it's more educational. Gloria Steinem is huge for the women's rights movement with Ms. Magazine. Uh, another big idea for the women's liberation or rights movement is equal pay for equal work. Every year I teach this when I'm in the class, I said, raise your hand if you know a woman who does not get paid for doing the same job as a man. Half the class. Uh, yeah, my mom, she has this job and she's upset because three of the guys she works with, even though she's been there longer than her, don't get, she, she doesn't get paid as much as them. Even now, I think it's like 80 cents on a dollar. A woman makes 80, a man makes a dollar. So if, say, a woman gets paid $800 a week, maybe a man might get $1,000 a week, okay? I bet some of you know somebody where that's happening to also. Okay, so put that for the times three. The glass ceiling with women. Okay, the glass ceiling is this. Bill is promoted. Jane is promoted. They both start working at the same time. Bill is promoted. Jane is promoted. Bill is promoted. Jane is promoted. Bill is promoted. Jane is promoted. Now it's time for us to be vice president or president. Bill is promoted. Bill is promoted. And she's right here. She's hit this glass here. Hey, what about me? Come on. I've got higher sales than him. I'm doing a better job than him. You know I'm better than him. Sorry. They would never say it. It's called the old boys club. 
a lot of these corporations with the men in charge, now let's face it, there are some high level corporations that are being run by women. But for many decades and decades and decades, it was like, there's only one bathroom up here on the 20th floor and it's only a men's room. We don't have any female bathrooms up here for the presidents. Sorry. It's like a glass ceiling. You're, no, no. Come. And that's starting to change. But even now, there are plenty of women who don't get promoted. And the guy becomes president. And the women's got better sales. People like her more. It's called the glass ceiling. Okay? You should know that term. That'll be on the test. Okay. Title IX for female sports. Title IX, very important. Okay? If any of you are on a sports team, girls, there's a good chance that you have a sports team because of Title IX. I'll say it. When I was growing up, there was no girls' basketball team. There was maybe a lacrosse team and maybe a field hockey team. But it was not equal. Because of Title IX... 1970s Title IX, women in sports. But you know what's interesting? The women won the won the uh, won the World Cup, and they just sued in court because they want equal pay for equal work, and they lost. They lost. So, don't think everything's perfect. Obviously, you know everything's not perfect. But Title IX is one of the big reasons we even have. So much women's sports. I just want to go back to the Betty for Don real quick. I want to show this so you get an idea of what it was like for women. Here we go. Boy, I need a haircut, don't I, guys? My wife wants to do it, but she's not the best. Woman power that sustained our grandmothers for 72 years in their struggle to get the right to vote. Welcome to the new wave of feminism. Welcome to each other. Welcome home. That's Betty for Don. 1950s housewife to women's activist, Betty for Dan. The happy housewife heroine was a woman who existed purely See this? through image. She was the American dream, flawless and without This is 1950s. The American women set aside their potential ambitions of education and careers and focused primarily on getting married and having children. This woman was hardly an individual exacting her image to that of an advertisement in a magazine. She lived through her husband, her children, and was content in doing nothing but nurturing them in the place they lived. She could not work because that was her husband's place, and she would only be looked down upon. She was to take pride in her femininity, the feminine mystique, as it were. In the hearts of the housewives who sat at home every day, living unfulfilled lives, they knew they were unhappy. The okay, so get that, guys. That's huge. So that book, the, the Feminine Mystique, helped people realize. Okay, here's Title IX, what I just talked about. Title IX. Watch this. This is a good one. Today, lots of girls play sports. But for a long time, girls were not encouraged to kick, throw, run, jump, shoot, slide, or hit like boys. So why did things change? And how much have they changed? Are girls and boys treated equally when it comes to sports? To begin to answer these questions, we have to look back. In 1972, Congress 72. passed a law called Title IX, which protected girls and women from discrimination in schools, colleges, and universities. This included discrimination in school-sponsored... Guys, schools. this is why we have more time, only law students and medical students women. female. And in high schools, only 7% of athletes were girls. Female athletes didn't get a lot of support either, and often had to provide their own uniforms and equipment. It was Title IX that forced school administrators to make sports more equal. But what does equal mean in sports? The government developed rules to measure equality under two general categories, participation and treatment. In the early days of Title IX, the number of girls playing sports was so low that it would have been very difficult for schools to suddenly provide exactly the same number of opportunities <laughs> for girls and boys. Instead, the government wrote rules that gave schools three options, or tests, to demonstrate fairness and opportunities for girls. The three tests are proportionality, progress, and satisfied interests. A 
a school can pick which test to follow. Proportionality means that girls should receive the same percentage of athletic opportunities as the percentage of girls in the student body. So if 51% of students are girls, then girls should have approximately 51% of the opportunities to play sports. The second test, progress, requires schools to make up for the days when girls had fewer opportunities by adding new sports for girls on a regular basis. The third test asks if girls' interests in athletics are satisfied. Under this test, a school must regularly ask female students what sports they are interested in, and also take into consideration the popularity of certain sports in the area where the school is located. It must then add teams according to the girls' interests. Another important part of Title IX is that it doesn't just look at how many athletic opportunities are available to each sex, but whether those opportunities are of equal quality. Specifically, Title IX requires equality between boys and girls teams for things like equipment and supplies, publicity, the scheduling of games and practice times, and the quality and number of coaches. Girls should also have equal access to locker rooms, practice spaces, and competitive facilities, as well as medical services. So if the best time to play basketball is on Friday nights because that's when most parents and fans can come, then the girls and boys teams should take turns playing on Friday night. If boys teams play in a stadium with lights, scoreboards, and concession stands, then girls teams must have the same opportunity. Okay. Either by sharing those facilities or getting their own of equal quality. I think we're about to run out here, guys. But as we all know, just because of I'll see you at part three. Take these them. notes. School officials are responsible for making sure there is Well, I'll, I'll go until it stops. But you can help, too, by keeping an eye on your own school. Look around. Are there a lot more boys than girls who play sports?